Well, good evening from Emerald Hills on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Doug, and we are glad you're here tonight. <clears throat> We're about to try to see some of the objects that are up there in the Emerald Hill skies. And uh, some of our uh, subscribers, you guys are kind enough to subscribe. We're at over 250 now, have been kind enough to ask us to say more about our equipment as we start up. So let's just do that real quickly. We're using a Rasa 8. And that's an 8-inch scope on top of a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount. That's this big white uh, piece of equipment here on top of the tripod. And the mount is really kind of where the magic happens. It controls the scope, keeps it in touch with the sky. And as the sky appears to rotate, it's really the Earth rotating, the mount uh, travels with the sky. So it sort of like freezes the sky in our pictures. And so we're thankful for a good mount to do that. And then we operate the scope from way out there, out about 200 feet away. And uh, it comes into this kind of little control room where we are here. On the end of the Rasa, there's a black dew shield. And there at the front of the Rasa, there's a uh, ZWO ASI 2600 uh, MC Pro camera. It's cool to about minus eight centigrade. And uh, that camera is streaming in USB 3, uh, streaming images back to us across this Raven Icron uh, uh, device that enables that uh, USB 3 signal to travel along CAT 7, uh, the 200 feet that we are inside of here. So that's the way we're operating inside the control room here. We use a a combination of software. You'll see us refer to Astro Planner. That's our uh, targeting software. You'll see us talk about Sky Safari. That's our planetarium software. It kind of shows us a computerized image of the sky. You'll see us talk about SharpCap. It's our imaging software. Uh, it allows us to stack images pretty quickly and average those together, get rid of the noise. Uh, you'll also see us refer to Nina. And let's go there right now as we get started. Uh, let's see, Nina. I'm going to see if I can help you guys be able to see Nina here right there. And that's the first place we'll go. We'll go to Nina, and what we're going to do is load the camera first. There's the camera, and then we're going to go to the focuser, and we're going to load the focuser, and there it is. By God's grace, that's working. Uh, then we're going to go to imaging, and we're going to start the autofocus routine. Now, this autofocus routine is really a fun, uh, a fun kind of routine. I'm, I'm sure that if you've uh, used uh, uh, astronomical equipment before, you are aware of the fact that, well, what is focus? How do you know when you're in focus? And with, uh, with telescopes, it's basically when the star shapes are as pinpoint as they can be. That's kind of the definition of focus. And if, if we stop and think about it, you could have a computer measure the width of those star shapes in your image. And when you move the focus a little bit away to the right, then the computer could measure those stars again and compare the widths. And then move it a little more to the right and snap another picture and the computer could measure the widths again. So what the computer is doing right now is exactly that. It's snapping a picture, measuring the width of all those pinpoints, and then moving the camera to the right, and it'll go about four or five uh, uh, stops to the right, and then it'll move back and start going to the left. And what it's gonna do is calculate uh, arithmetically. It's gonna use math to calculate those star shapes. And it uses a thing called the half flux radius, which is a fancy way of saying it's gonna take half of the star, the radius, and it's gonna measure that star shape and figure out its flux, the amount of light that it's emitting in the shape. And uh, it uses a pretty complicated algorithm to calculate all that on multiple stars, not just one star that we're focusing on here. So as it calculates those half flux radii in each of these images that it's ca capturing now, it is going to keep turning the focuser and it's gonna remember where the focuser was located, and it's very, very finite little steps that the focuser is covering now. It's gonna measure where the focuser was located at each half flux radius uh, star shape size for each of the image that it takes. And after it studies 
four or five to the right and four or five to the left, it scratches its head and it tries to calculate where were the star shapes the smallest. And it even uses a hyperbola with a trend line to try to figure out uh, how in the world it will imagine what is the best uh, place where the stars were the smallest. And if everything goes well, what it will do is it will come away with a position in which it finds the best focus of all. And, you know, it's uh, hard when you try to focus a telescope in any way, especially your typical telescope. And by typical, I mean uh, uh, with an average light gathering power telescope. The faster that the telescope breathes in images, uh, light, you could say, the, the faster it breathes in light, the wider the aperture, and also along with that, if you study photography, the smaller the depth of field you've got. So that means that um, the, the, the more quickly that your telescope is able to see the stars, the more quickly that, that can happen, the narrower the depth of field and the more critical the focus zone becomes. In an average light gathering power telescope, light gathering speed telescope, uh, the critical focus zone is pretty wide and you can make some mistakes with the uh, focus. But as we get to faster scopes, the critical focus zone becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, this telescope that we're using tonight, ARASA, is kind of famous for being particularly fast at gathering in light. And as a result, you can imagine that corollary, it has a very small critical focus zone. We're talking about down to 11 microns wide. And that's like, um, you know, I mean, we're talking about the width of a human hair wide is that critical focus zone. It is so easy for this rasa to be off focus. So that's why I like personally using math as the focus rather than just winging it with, you know, looking through the eyepiece or looking through a camera. Uh, that's hard for me because I think that, uh, first of all, the seeing, they talk about, you know, astronomers, we talk about this idea of seeing how much disturbance there is in the sky. And we also talk about, uh, you know, the atmospheric disturbances that are going on out there. And when you're looking at that and you're trying to compare that, your human eye is just averaging all that stuff out. It is very, very difficult. Whereas when we use math to do this, we oftentimes can come up with a lot better uh, calculus so that we can calibrate the focus more closely. Now it's not an exact science and uh, the program that we're using here in NINA, this is a very new routine in NINA. We're talking about a matter of less than months that this has been going on. But now with this image, you're starting to see, it looks like we're seeing kind of the bottom of the focusing parabola. And if luck is with us, if uh, God blesses and the next position of focus, if it keeps climbing up on that left-hand side, then uh, NINA, uh, which stands for Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy, in this subroutine, it's going to be happy with having found that bottom of this parabola and therefore um, what it perceives to be the tightest focus. Now, you can see there in the middle, between those two uh, lower focus zones, the trend line is trying to imagine where that middle of that focus zone was. But you can see that between 4150 and 4170, there was some, uh, you know, I guess confusion. And that's probably just a, a factor of the atmospheric seeing uh, what, what the temperature was doing out there and maybe a satellite flying by in the, in the image. All kinds of things can affect this math. But as you can see, we're at least seeing a kind of a, um, a trend line here. And what Nina does is it goes ahead and focuses using a motorized focuser for us. It goes ahead and focuses a telescope in the place that it thought was the best. And what we're going to hope is that when we get to the images that we see, we're, that we're going to like what we see. Tonight, we're going to start a new series of objects. And this particular set of objects we're going to look at, they're called the Caldwell objects. And they're maybe not quite as well known as the Messier list. This list would be maybe a little bit harder 
a little bit uh, maybe out, more out of the way objects. But we're going to try to see if we can uh, make out some of these Caldwell objects tonight and, and observe them. What I'd love to do is get us in the habit of maybe staying on an object for just, I don't know, six minutes or eight minutes, something like that. Um, and with that routine, it's going to feel, at least to me, I don't know how it'll feel to you, a little bit rushed. But I hope that over time, we'll get used to that pace and we'll be able to uh, maybe travel a little bit faster. I'm going to say welcome here on the stream. If you happen to be uh, listening in and you'd like to say where you're listening in from, we hope you'll join us. I know it's, uh, you know, it's late. Uh, for some people, it depends on where you are in the world. Our European uh, users are probably, our European friends are probably already asleep. But uh, if you're here in the States or wherever you are in the world, I wish you'd uh, say hello from and then fill in the blank. There's Frank. Uh, boy, Frank, you are a faithful friend. Thank you for being there from Schenectady, New York. And hello to you and thanks for wishing good luck. It's a very pleasant night outside. I would estimate the temperature is probably 65 so far. That's just an estimate. Let's see how close I was. Let's let's open up the actual uh, weather app and see where we are temperature-wise here in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, I was off a degree, 66 degrees. But wow, it sure feels uh, pleasant. Uh, you can go out there with nothing more than your shirt sleeves and enjoy the night. There's Lance. Uh, glad to have you here again from Idaho, Lance. And you're a good friend as well. You've you've been no stranger here. We're lucky to have you. Hey, look, our um, our uh, Nina has done, and it's chosen a focus now. I'm going to try to capture this if I can. 41463. I'm going to I'm going to try to go over and make a note of that. I, I try to keep track of that and see how that compares to other focal focus, uh, critical focus zones that we've gotten before, 41,463. Yeah, that's not too far off. Of course, you know, temperature can affect, and I'm going to put this, that this was on 9, 10, 20, 21. And uh, over time, I like to kind of study that and see how we're looking. Well, so let's get started. First stop then is our targeting software. Uh, we use a software called Astro Planner, and we'll, uh, oh, before we leave, almost forgot, let's disconnect the camera from uh, our equipment here. So we're going to disconnect first the focuser and also disconnect the camera. Uh, we use a, a hub of, of astronomy information called ASCOM. That's pretty, pretty popular for watching this on a recording. Uh, thanks for being a part of this. Uh, we are glad you're there. And uh, you're used to that ASCOM, I bet. We use that as kind of our, um, our hub. And if we log in more than one program that hogs the, the signal of that camera, then uh, it's not a good thing at all. We, we want just one program at a time to be able to see that camera. I'm looking here in our um, uh, live stream, and I see that the Brampton Observatory channel is here from Ontario, Canada. My goodness, that is such an honor to have the Brampton Observatory here. I'm going to have to look you up and watch some of your videos. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. And there's Amy. Thank you for jumping in with us, Amy. You know, Jeff has told us how much you uh, love astronomy. And so we're happy to have you with us as well, Amy. Uh, welcome. So let's go over to um, uh, Astro Planner. And the first thing we're going to do is sort the list by visibility and altitude. This is going to find. The, notice this column here called altitude. It's going to tell us which objects are the highest. And the first one here is NGC 6888. So what we're going to try to do is connect our telescope. Everybody cross your fingers. Unparked. Okay, looks like that worked. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to slew to the first object here, and let's see what happens. Slewing to coordinates. Okay, now as we, as we watch our um, scope cam, we hopefully are going to see the telescope spinning around to that location. And while that's spinning, let's go to Sky Safari. And if we can just stay connected tonight, that little rectangle that you see in the middle of Sky Safari is actually Slewing a picture complete. of the kind of uh, area, the depth of field, the, the field of view 
uh, rather, field of view that our telescope can see. And what I love about this is that we can come back here for seconds, kind of see uh, where is the object, you know, in, in relation to the sky. So we'll come back here in, in a second and check that out. Now let's go over to SharpCap. And what we do in SharpCap is we um, connect our camera and we actually start taking pictures of this object which is, by the way, we'll go on and name it here, NGC 6888. And uh, you can see the, the uh, image there popped in rather quickly. We've got this on a three second exposure at 400 gain. Uh, the first thing we want to do is see if we can uh, uh, line up our um, line up our telescope with these pictures as they relate to uh, the pictures in a library of software that we have. And that library uh, matching up with the real-time pictures through the telescope, that process of matching up is called plate solving and happens that SharpCap Pro has plate solving built in, so we don't have to go to another program to do that. So what it's doing now is comparing all those stars in the live view through our telescope tonight. Sinking to coordinates. And typically the Sluing first to plate solve is a little bit off. You can see it was 3.64 degrees off. That's because we don't do any kind of aligning beyond the polar alignment, which is adjusting the mechanics of the scope. We just go to the first image without that three star alignment that a lot of people do. And we use plate solving to line up the scope with reality and the plate solving kind of uh, tells the telescope how far it was off so the telescope can remember. Oh, okay, sorry I was off a bit, and it tries to adjust. Now what we want to do is adjust our exposure so that we can see a little bit dimmer images, and we want to lower the gain down. It'll give us a lot better, um, a lot better image if we can lower that gain. So let's go up to maybe... Um, See, this is um, the Crescent Nebula, which I happen to remember is a very dim object, a uh, faint object. We're going to put this on 100 gain at 30 seconds, and we're going to see how we do. Um, we're going to let that pull in just one frame at 30 seconds, and then as soon as it does, we're going to start uh, what we call live stacking. And this live stacking has revolutionized astronomy it is, in fact, a big part of what makes the process of electronically assisted astronomy work, EAA. And that's the kind of astronomy that we use here, EAA. It is the process of using as fast a scope as you can get with um, maybe a filter that filters out the city lights wherever you are, and we do that. We have a Celestron light pollution filter that's kind of designed to work with this Rasa 8. And then you combine that with this live stacking algorithm built into SharpCap. And when you put those things together with a pretty sensitive camera with some good size uh, pixels, then this is what you see. In the very, very first uh, image, we're already seeing the Crescent Neb Nebula live. And to me, that's just amazing. The fact that uh, we're able to, to see this, I'm kind of going to try to get my picture out of the way here. Let's see, what's the best way for me to do that? Uh, maybe if I just move it over, or is that all the farther over it'll go? Let's get it out of the way here. Maybe put it over here somewhere. I just don't want to block the, the stuff that's important. Um, so what SharpCap is going to do is align these frames. And again, I'll see if we can let you be able to look at everything that's going on here. Um, you can see that in this lower left, it's stacked two frames. And that's a total exposure of 60 seconds. So what we'll do now is we'll um, reset the color balance back to square one. And then we'll try to do a, an automatic color, color balance uh, setting. And then we'll um, reset this uh, histogram. A histogram is a drawing that lets you see 
uh, the colors drawn in graphical form. We'll set our black level just to the right of this peak. And then we'll move our mids in so that our mids are kind of pushed a little bit. We want to see more of those mids than usual. And what we hope that will happen then is that crescent nebula will start appearing there. Now, oftentimes, I notice with the Celestron filter, the greens pop in a little bit much. So as we push those up, uh, we're going to bring the greens down a little bit. We're also going to zoom in a little bit because this crescent nebula is kind of small. So right there, we're, we're starting to see it. And now that we've got live stacking going on, it lets us now go over to Sky Safari. And let's, let's see if in Sky Safari, we can, um, let's see, let's search for uh, this NGC 6888. And right there it is. And let's listen to this tour via audio. NGC 6888. Uh, why am I not hearing that? Let's see. Maybe you were hearing that because I saw your, oh, I bet, I bet the reason why I'm not is I bet my monitor there. Now, I hope that'll let me hear this. Let's, let's try this again. It is a faint loop-shaped nebula near the star Gamma Cygnus, the middle star of the Northern Cross. Little is seen in a small telescope, but a 200 millimeter reflector begins to bring out a faint narrow band, like a piece of string, which forms a portion of a circle. A much larger telescope is needed to see more. This nebula is in the same field as the variable R.S. Cygni. This is a very red star and dips in brightness over about 400 days. It never gets too faint to be followed with small telescopes and is therefore suitable for those wishing to tackle variable stars. Okay, so this crescent nebula, it's just 20 minutes by 10 minutes. That's how small it is. This is, remember, if you've got your sky 360 degrees all the way around a circle, we're only able to see about 180 degrees at once. You know, basically, what what was that called in um, high school that we used to use it as a pro protractor? I always got protractor and compass mixed up. Protractor, I think. Uh, if you divide that 180 degrees, then and you narrow down to the one degree where this crescent nebula is located, and then you divide that one degree into 60 little hash marks. So now we're very, very tiny. This object is only 20 of those hash marks wide. So it's very unevenly illuminated, and uh, we see this arc on this one side. That's why it makes a crescent, and we call it, therefore, the Crescent Nebula. It says that uh, a multitude of Milky Way field stars shine through the nebula, and that bright keystone with a ninth and tenth magnitude star forms the east side. So we'll see if we can see that when we come back. And then uh, it's about 4,700 light years away. And the way it was formed is by a fast stellar wind from that Wolf Rayet star HD192163. It sent out that wind to make the outer envelope. So it was like ejecting all this material. And then it sent out a smaller wind. And this stellar wind then collides with those two winds together. Uh, when the star became a red giant, these two shock waves collided. So let's go back and see what Sharp Cap has has uh, gathered here, and what we hope happens, of course, over time, is that this nebula becomes a lot more clear. Look, look up here at the top. I hope you can see that over YouTube. We're starting to see this material of the top of the crescent here, and let's zero in a little bit more. We're at 40 percent. Let's come in 60%. Look at that material now. We're starting to see the entire crescent. And look how this side down here has become a little more, I guess you'd say, wouldn't that be a little more hydrogen alpha, uh, that reddish color, uh, that hydrogen alpha gas that glows red. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing all kinds of shades here, but they say I'm kind of colorblind. I don't know what you can see. If, you, if you've got good color vision, tell us what you're making out here. But this is really interesting to me to see that entire um, crescent. Now, we do want to watch our time. And we've said that uh, 
we will only stay on an object uh, six or seven minutes and look, we're at six and a half minutes right now. So I wanna go up here under our um, sharp cap settings and I wanna look here and I don't think you're able to see this because uh, this opens up a new window, but I wanna make sure that the object name is being included in this name and see, uh, use organized captured files into subfolders. Why is that not letting me uh, mark that? We'll have to get someone like Frank to tell me why that's not letting. Maybe it's because we're in the process of live stacking and we have a name and maybe because when you're in the middle of that, you can't change that, I bet. So for the next object, we need to change this before we start live stacking again and make it so it saves the name. Because I was noticing that uh, last time we were out, it was not. So there you go, uh, NGC 6888. It's also known as Caldwell 27. And remember, we're doing this list of Caldwell objects. So what we do now is we look up in this Caldwell 27, and now we can see, can you see that? Caldwell 27. There you go. So we're going to read about each of these objects now as we look at these pictures later. Uh, wow, it's got... Uh, one, two, three, three full pages on the Crescent Nebula. And it was observed first by William Herschel, I guess, discovered by William Herschel in 1792. Um, and this is from a class of nebula that's sometimes called bright nebula, but that's kind of a misnomer in a way because it's not very bright, is it? it? It is a misnomer. It basically means that it's so obscure that most amateurs don't even try to hunt it down because they're not able to see it through their, their eyepieces. But that's where uh, electronically assisted astronomy really helps us because we can pull out these dark, dark images, faint images using this live stacking procedure. Okay, it's been eight minutes and 30 seconds. That's our limit. So what we're gonna do now is say, save exactly a scene and uh, that's saving under process. Yeah, see, that did not save the file name with it. So we're going to have to fix that, aren't we? So let's stop our live stacking. And before we do anything else, let's see if we can go fix that. Let's go to sharp cap settings and look at file names and hope. No, it's still not letting us organize these into folders. That's so sad can show the number of the number but it is not showing the file name append no uh, file name templates live stack here we go <coughs> let's just add this manually because it's not doing it here let's say um, live stack processed that's what we want we're going to go curly brace target name curly brace this is almost like programming isn't it um, and then we're going to put a dash uh, hopefully that will hopefully next time it'll have the name of the object in with the object. So Frank, is there any recent version of Sharp Cap should allow you to change the name while live stacking? Well, this is 4.0.8138. I thought this was fairly recent. Uh, it's not the most recent uh, beta, but it's fairly recent. Okay, let's go back now to Astro Planner. And you notice we're, we're doing just the Caldwell objects. So this next one here, oh, you know what? We got to do um, quick observation. And in our quick observation, it is going to say, um, where is, we're going to say, um, saw the whole crescent, something like that. Um, and we're not going to put pictures in tonight because we're trying to save time. Now let's go to the next Caldwell object, which is Caldwell 15. It's NGC 6826. And let's slew to that Sluing object. to coordinates. And again, we'll, um, there's the scope starting Sluing to turn. Complete. It didn't move very much, did it? 
And uh, now let's go to sharp cap. And this is NGC 6826. You know what we ought to do is use the Caldwell numbers for these. This is a Caldwell night anyway. So let's start using the Caldwell numbers. This is C15. And let's bring our zoom back out to auto so we see the whole picture. And since we didn't move very much, we probably don't have to um, uh, plate solve. Oh, I wonder if that'll take us 30 seconds to do that plate solve frame, but it's too late now. Um, it'll, it'll just have to grab it. Um, when we move quite a ways, uh, we ought to uh, plate solve again, especially so that our uh, mount which is the thing that controls the telescope, remember, our mount can file that new image location with the, with the, all the, the calibrating inside the mount. And every time you plate solve on a new object and the, and the real-time images can synchronize with the sky Sinking that it has, the sky that Slewing, it has. Slewing complete. And that's just four hundredths of a degree off. So that was so close, it almost wasn't worth it, huh? But that's OK. Um, now that we've plate solved, we're ready to start live stacking. And uh, let's go ahead and get that going. And we need to clear our live stack from the last, uh, the last image that we did. That's just something manually you have to do. So let's let that work for a minute. And while that's working, Let's go back, and this is Caldwell 15. So let's start learning these Caldwell names. I, I wish we could learn those. Uh, so let's go look for Caldwell 15, see if it finds it. Yes, it does. It's the Blinking Planetary Nebula. Let's take a listen. NGC 6826 is a planetary nebula in Cygnus the Swan. It's next to the naked eye stars Kappa, Iota, and Theta. So finding the nebula reminds one of those college fraternity clubs where they have mysterious Greek letters. This planetary is fairly round and bright and an obvious object, like a star that has refused to come to focus. It may appear greenish, but some will dispute this. In telescopes up to 150 millimeters in size, little more can be seen. In 200 millimeter scopes, the central star is visible. A planetary nebula is formed when the star in the middle sets loose a cloud of gas in response to instability. A round disk or loop like an unstrung tennis racket is typical in these objects. All right. Let's bring us over to Sky Safari now, and let's um, center on this object. We should already be centered on it, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's just see if we are. Mm, yeah, let's center on it so that Sky Safari will zoom in on it when I zoom. OK, so that's what we're hoping to see. That's not a very good picture of it, is it? Must be a super tiny object. NGC 6826 or Caldwell 15, the blinking planetary nebula. Now notice how it's past the meridian. And I'm looking at our scope. Look at our scope and the way it is leaning back. See how those weights are kind of beginning to kick up a little high? That's probably not a good idea because it's looking past the meridian, kind of like if you leaned your lazy boy chair in the living room and you went way back past um, the meridian. Uh, so I think that's going to be a problem for us. But anyway, let's get a picture of where we are in the sky. So we're going to back off here and let's kind of look at our, our ground. I wonder if we have this on a, oh yeah, there's our ground. Okay, so we're pretty high up, aren't we? Let's uh, check and see what our what our current altitude is, 78 degrees. So if you stop and think about the fact that uh, straight up in the sky, see, would be 90 degrees. That would be what we call the zenith in astronomy. 90 degrees. See, right here is where we're, where we're looking at the telescope. Let me go back to Sky Safari so you can look at this with me. Right here is where we're looking at the telescope. And this is the... the um, the horizon. And now look at the zenith. So we are almost looking straight up. And let's see if we can get a picture of where we are in relation to some 
constellation, so you might be able to find this. Here's the Little Dipper, and remember it has Polaris in it, and if you've ever noticed, if the Little Dipper is, is pouring water out, then it's usually pouring water into the Big Dipper. So look at this. This is the Big Dipper. There's the handle, and there's the cup of the Big Dipper. So the Little Dipper dumps water out into the Big Dipper. Now let's see where we're where we're pointing the telescope and remember where those dippers are. So if you took in the night sky and you imagined the Big Dipper with a line through the cup through the end star of the Little Dipper, which is called Faircad, Faircad, it would point at this object when you were almost straight up. And again, what you'd be pointing to is NGC 6826 or Caldwell 15. It's colloquially known as the blinking planetary. So let's go back to SharpCap now and let's see what's happening and see if we can find this thing. The blinking planetary. Okay, first let's, um, let's go ahead and do a reset and an auto stretch and a color balance and an auto an auto balance. And then let's pull our blacks over again. And let's get our mids so they're not quite making that greenish tinge. We don't really like that greenish tinge because it's not really very natural. It means we've pushed our greens too much. Now let's start zooming in. And I bet you if we zoom in at 50%, there's that blinking planetary. And I don't know if you can see that that's a little bit greenish tinged or not. Just a little bit greenish tinged. And if you stop and think uh, to an early astronomer, that might have looked like some of these other larger stars. But to, to larger scopes, look how it's now almost like an orb. So can you imagine looking at that orb, the, the way that it would have looked to a person in an early telescope, it would have looked like a uh, planet. And that's where the name indeed comes from. Now, to me, it looks like to me we're overexposing this. Let's drop that down to maybe, um, I don't know what. Uh, maybe I have no idea what will show us. Let's try 20 seconds. And let's clear our livestock and start that stacking over again real quick because that was so overexposed that we weren't able to see anything in the middle of that planetary nebula. And we weren't able to see that shell being kicked out at all. Because why? Because 30 seconds was too long of an exposure on this object. Now you might ask yourself, how do we know uh, how long to expose things? Well, it's kind of more art, isn't it, than anything else. Um, on a planetary nebula, when you do your first exposure, you want to kind of only have a little bit of the external shell going on. Um, that still looks too bright for this Rasa. My goodness, that's crazy. You know what else we could do? Rather, let's scoot our gain down to zero and put this back at 10 seconds. And now let's um, clear the livestock. And I'm trying to get this so that we're seeing that outer shell. So in right now, we should see well, it's better, but I still think we can do better. Let's drop this to five seconds. That's a bright object, isn't it? Let's clear it one more time. Now, at five seconds, these frames will accumulate fast, and that's in our favor. If we can uh, accumulate these frames quickly, then uh, it'll, it'll actually average the value of those frames more quickly, and I think it'll be in our favor. It talked about the sizes of telescopes, and, you know, um, Aperture is such an important part of, um, of astronomy, aperture being the width of our uh, telescope. And I want to just confess that I am indeed um, a little bit nostalgic tonight because this particular uh, telescope, the um, Rasa 8, has been so good to me over this last year. And I feel a little bit like a turncoat. I am now preparing for the day that we are going to try to sell this telescope because why? We're going to try to 
use a Rasa 11. And believe it or not, it has already arrived. I don't know how we managed in the middle of all this uh, pandemic to uh, be able to, to land one because they're out of stock almost everywhere. But we did find a Rasa 11 at High Point Scientific. I believe it was High Point Scientific. And uh, this Rasa 8 is a 203 millimeter aperture. So it has a 400 millimeter focal length. So it is the kind of aperture that we need to be able to see. And now if you look carefully, look inside of that little green nebula. And I wonder if in your, if in your view, it doesn't help, does it, if I get rid of all this stuff, does it? Because that just shows you more of the same picture, doesn't it? That doesn't enlarge it. And that's one of the reasons we're switching to a Rasa uh, 11. It is uh, basically one and a half times uh, zoomed in. So it is going to zoom in on objects like this a little better. But the other thing it is, is it's more aperture. It, it has basically not quite, but almost two times the light gathering. Uh, that 11 inch aperture as compared to the eight inch. Uh, but we're now seeing, if you study the inside of that planetary nebula now, if you get out your binoculars or your magnifying glass, now we can see that center star, see, because we're not overexposing it now. It's a, it's a very bright little pinpoint inside of that green uh, planetary nebula. Now, I know what some of you are saying that are experienced astronomers, people at the Brampton Observatory channel, and maybe Frank, he's been doing this, and Lance has been doing this. Uh, some of you are going to say, this is not a good fit for the Rasa. And you're right. It's probably not the Rasa's strong suit, is it? Because why? Because this planetary nebula is so teeny tiny. Um, this thing is so teeny tiny that <clears throat> it is basically not showing off uh, the Rasa at all. It is two arc minutes wide. So two arc minutes, two of those little notches inside one degree, which makes up one 180th of the sky. But wow, um, nevertheless, it does let us see that pinpoint. And the reason why is because the reason why the Rasa is not showing off its stuff is because it is only 400 millimeter focal length. Now, some of the astronomers with us tonight like uh, Frank, I believe you have a telescope that's typically a thousand millimeters, and that would show off this object a little better and it would fit in your field of view a little better. The Rasa is kind of a wide field telescope, but it still doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the greenish tinge of this object and be able to understand, okay, so a planetary nebula is that gas that's flowing out where this inner star is discarding its outer shell of uh, material. And when it did that, it uh, it discarded you know, who knows how many suns worth of material that it blew out. And when it did, it kind of became a white dwarf inside of there. And we're seeing that white dwarf just barely. Okay, what do you say we, at this point, uh, now go back to our image in SharpCap and get ready to save our image. And I think we can do that by getting this uh, thumbtack back here and getting this uh, panel back there. We'll, um, boy, I really like that. Even though I'm colorblind, even I can see that that has that greenish tinge of a planetary nebula. And remember, this one's called the blinking planetary. I don't know if that blinks or not. Let's see uh, if our save does any better now. Yeah, see, look, now at the head of our file name, it's got C15. Uh, NGC 6826 would be another name, okay? So we've saved this. Let's stop live stacking. And uh, let's, uh, while, we're, while we're thinking about it, let's go back out to auto. Now let's go out to our Astro Planner and look at what our next object is going to be. This is our third object and we're 45 minutes in. We gotta make up some time. Oh, you know what else we gotta do is do a new observation and say, wh why does it always search for catalogs there? I don't understand that, it steals my cursor. Uh, wow, greenish tinged um, and um, white dwarf visible. 
Uh, but it'll be more visible when we get this uh, Rasa 11 working. All right, so that's our, our C15. Now we're going to go to NGC 6885. And let's slew to that. Slewing to coordinates. And um, there you can see, wow, we stayed in this. Slewing complete. We stayed in this backward, leaning over backwards thing. I don't like that, really. I think in a while we're going to get a warning about this. But you know what? We'll wait till we do. We'll just live dangerously. Um, let's now go over to Sharp Cap. And um, we're going to change the label to C37. It's NGC 6885, by the way. You know, we could also do this. We could say NGC 6885 and put in both objects in the name. They're, they're you know... It'll let us do that. OK. And we're not going to do a plate solve. We don't need to. It's just going to take up time. We're just going to start live stacking. And we're going to clear out our last live stack. Now, this object is the Volpecula cluster. Volpecula cluster. It's an open cluster. I wonder if five seconds is going to be enough. I don't think it will. Um, yeah, live stacking is paused. It is not. It is not seeing much. So let's get a little better. Um, Twenty seconds, maybe. Actually, let's put our gain at one hundred. And let's try this at ten seconds and see if that gives us a good enough picture. Okay, so we're, we're going to make sure we see a, a good, a good subframe here. So we're going to watch that picture come in. Not quite long enough, is it? Let's make it 20 seconds. So we're at 100 gain. Oh, Frank is filling us in here. I love my 8-inch SCT. That says Schmidt Cassegrain. I can use it at a native F10. Wow, 2,000 millimeters. And it's F6.3. And that that's uh, 1,000... 280 millimeters at using a reducer to get it to f6.3. And then he can put the hyperstar fitting on the end and go to f2 and it's 390 millimeters, more similar to what we're using tonight. Also can use it at f20 for planetary using a two times Marlowe. That's just fantastic. But you are correct. When I'm using the hyperstar equivalent to Rasa, small targets are not its forte. Agreed, Frank. Boy, this is not a very bright part of the sky. Are we going to have to go back to 30 seconds, I think? What am I doing wrong here? Is it that? Is it that faint here that we're? I cannot imagine that this is a cluster. We're going to see here when we get to 30 seconds. But this is the Caldwell list after all. Caldwell list is going to be a little bit fainter, a little bit harder to to observe than say the Messier list would be. Man, there's just a little bit more there. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to boost this gain up to 200. And while we're at it, let's do this. Oh, yeah. So our histogram was out of sorts, and I don't know how that happened. But let's go back to 100, and let's make this 20 seconds again, because I don't think we're going to need, we're going to need to go 30 seconds with this object. And let's uh, reset this again, and rather than auto stretch that, let's just see what this looks like at 20 second. No, nope, it's still kind of. I wonder if um, if we should just auto stretch this. Because why? Because you know what? We're not going to have to live stack this. We're just going to be able to see this as is. So let's just do this display histogram and be content with it. Because there's that cluster right in the middle. There's nothing really to live stack here. This is not going to reveal some faint nebula. The stars that we see are the stars that we see. 
So I'm just playing around with this a little bit. The Brampton Observatory, using a 14-inch Edge HD with Hyperstar in the observatory. Oh, also purchased a Rasa 8 for Widefield. Nice. Well done, Brampton. We like having you in. Look, now you can make out that cluster in the middle. It kind of looks like a triangle, doesn't it? Look at that triangle there. Volpeculi, Volpeculi cluster. So let's just dash over to Sky Safari for a second. And this is C37. Um, and let's see what we find here when we say search for Let's use the NGC 6885, and let's listen to this audio tour. NGC 6885 is a bright cluster in Volpecula, the little constellation with a big name. In a 60 millimeter scope, two knots of stars are visible, and number 20 of Volpecula stands out as the brightest member. In 150 millimeter scopes, about two dozen stars are seen. The brightest star, called 20, is a delicate yellow color. Almost right on top of the cluster is a fainter group, NGC 6882. These are Milky Way open clusters, and the low power observing is grand here. Just south is a famous M27, or Dumbbell Nebula. Okay, when they say low power, they're talking about uh, backing off and, and observing this whole area here. So, in a Sky Safari, Let's look at this cluster. See how that bright star is there? And let's see. I bet you anything we are. It says NGC 6882 and NGC 6885 are not readily distinguishable as separate entities. 20 vol, 20 VUL. So why don't we center on this in Sky Safari and zoom in. And again, if you stop and think about, this is our rectangular field of view. So it is not oriented correctly. What we want to do is rotate that. Um, Essentially, we want to rotate that about 90 degrees if we were going to align itself. <clears throat> but I don't think we'll mess with that, with that right now. That yellow star that you see up there at the top, and this is the center of the cluster, 20 Volpecula, and this is 19 Volpecula. Now let's go back over to Sharp Cap. That's the yellow star, 19 Volpecula. And this is the center of the cluster, 20 Volpecula. And you can see when you look at Sky Safari, we're seeing pretty much all those stars, but we could expose them a little, a little more here and see more of them if we wanted to, just by bumping up our gain some. And it would allow us to, to draw a little more detail of the stars you know, an open cluster, some people look at this and they don't really find it to be very beautiful. Uh, it's basically just a bunch of stars traveling together. But I've always kind of liked open clusters. I kind of feel like, I don't know, it reminds me of Christmas maybe. Um, I don't know why it does that. Christmas lights maybe? All those Christmas tree lights. That's beautiful, isn't it? Okay, we're gonna save a snapshot of this. And let's see the file name that it gives it. Because this is a different file name template. It's waiting for the next frame. Oh good, it included the name. All right, so there you have uh, that open cluster. Now I think we only had one other open cluster in the target list tonight. Because I, I know some people aren't, uh, they don't get a big kick out of these, but I kind of like them. And I think they're cool to think about this group of stars traveling together. If we were on a planet that's, uh, you know, revolving around one of these stars, like our sun, would we look up in the sky and see, you know, would we see, I don't know, 
a whole sky of maybe 20 stars as bright as Sirius? Or would there be five stars as bright as the sun? I can't predict what it would look like, uh, but I know for one thing, it is cool that these this group of stars is all traveling together. And look at that yellow color come out really well on 19 Vulpecula. Okay, so we're going to go back to our uh, targeting software, which we also use for our our observing software, you know, our, our logging software. And we're going to say, uh, we saw 19 Vulpecula as, you know, super yellow and uh, 20 Vulpecula as the center of NGC 6885. A beautiful open cluster object. OK, now our next uh, target is the Cirrus Nebula. If I remember right, this is super, super faint. So let's see if we can go to this. Um, we're going to slew to this object. Slewing to coordinates. And let's hope we can get off of. Slewing complete. Oh, rats, we didn't. We're still leaning back with those weights way high. Um, it spells trouble because we will reach a point that we are leaning back so high, you know, that it'll be plum ugly. Uh, but fortunately, we use a, a um, what would you call it, a telescope control software, I guess. Let me just show you that real quick. The telescope control software that we use is this. It's a green swamp server over here on this right-hand side. And this gives us a three-dimensional view of our telescope. So you can see we are not in trouble yet. But look how that telescope is leaning back against the uh, meridian, um, almost ready to pitch those weights up over its head. That's not a fun thing. But fortunately, Green Swamp Server stops before it does that. So that's good. We don't want to we don't want to throw our weights over the top of the meridian, do we? Let's go now to Sharp Cap. And in sharp cap, let's put in our new name first. Oh my goodness, you can already see that. Like laying over the top of the, that is amazing. This is uh, NGC 6960 or Caldwell 34. And man, since we're doing this, let's just go ahead and put Cirrus Nebula in there. I mean, File names are cheap, right? Uh, let's go back out to full frame. And I'll tell you what, let's leave things at 20 seconds just because I think I'm already seeing this. Uh, I don't think we have to uh, plate solve because I'm seeing this object in the middle of there. Let's do live stack this. And I think we're ready to live stack and let's clear out our last live stack. And let's reset this side histogram and just leave it reset. And let's don't try to uh, use that display histogram over there at the side this time. Oh, yeah. Now let's uh, reset this and get an auto stretch on it. And let's do a color match of it just so we get things started. Oh, my goodness, that is so beautiful. You know, did you hear me just gasp? That is breathtaking. Wow. Frank says, one of my favorite ta uh, targets, the witch's broom. Wow. That's amazing. And this did not make the Messier list, sadly. I guess because Messier's little three-inch telescope couldn't make this out in the Paris the bright lights of Paris. But I am so interested now in hearing the um, the description on this. Let's search for NGC 6960. And let's listen to this audio tour. NGC 6960 is one of the most wondrous sights in the sky. This is the Great Veil Nebula in Cygnus. 
The object is a huge arc of light several degrees in diameter and caused by the explosion of a star tens of thousands of years ago. In a large telescope, the veil is like a white river running through a black canyon seen at dusk. The veil's densest portion is at the star 52 Cygni, which looks like a golden lantern tossed into the waves and flickering feebly below. Observationally, the veil has a reputation of being a difficult object. But times and attitudes change. Since the object is very large, it can be seen by 7x50 binoculars. Small telescopes, equipped with modern accessories, can also spot the veil in a field that a filter has darkened. Low power is best for this object. The sky must be moonless and without the unwanted rays of streetlights. All that done, the veil can be viewed with a 90 millimeter telescope. Wow. This is amazing. I mean, imagine the fact that that's been up there all along. And we walk around through our cities and we look up in the sky and we can see about 20 stars in Louisville. And that's it. Bortal 6 maybe, bordering on Bortal 5 on the outskirts where we are, Bortle 6 maybe. We see about 20 stars in all those city lights. But boy, you put a light pollution filter on this telescope and you stack nine frames with just three minutes of data and look what you can see. I mean, I am amazed at this wisp here. Look at that wisp. And then trying to figure out which wisp is which. Which wisp is which. Wow. There's just so much to this object. Let's back off again to full field. See, I think we're going to see some stuff here. But let's just focus on the wisp for a minute. Remember in the uh, description, the way the guy read that it's like this uh, star, which is 52 Cygni, is it? 52 Cygni is floating on the waves of this wisp. Jeff Horn, we are so glad you joined us, brother. Uh, thanks for finding that announcement in Cloudy Nights. If you want to get announcements of these, you can also subscribe by going to emeraldhillskies.com and you can put your email address in there and we will always send you at least like half a day in advance. We'll send you an email that we're going to do this. I try to do it farther ahead, but sometimes I hedge my bets afraid that we might see clouds. But tonight, sure enough, our our clear skies have stayed with us. Look at this material out here. And what makes that wisp? I mean, I guess some people call this the filamentary nebula. Um, or is this the network nebula? Um, they say that it gets switched. The cirrus nebula? Why would you call it cirrus? Bridal Veil Nebula. Now that's a better name. This looks like a bridal veil to me. Look at that. Wow. And that's up there all the time. That was just five minutes of information and 20 seconds uh, per subframe. 16, 16 subframes. I mean, I'm hooked. You, you are right, Frank. This is an amazing target. It is so beautiful. The other side, the West Vale, is really nice, too. All right, now you've got me curious. I tell you what, gang, we're just six minutes in, but let's go ahead and save this. And the other side, would that be 6962? 6962. Let's center on that and get a picture of this in 
Oh my goodness, look at this. Uh, look with me in Sky, Sky Safari and we get a lot better picture of what we're looking at. See, what we're looking at is, this is our field of view, remember. We're looking at this thing right here, which is that bridal veil deal. But look at this, 69.79. And then look at this, what is this? That's 69.95. So let's first go look at 6979. I don't know how this will work. I tell you what, since we still have our scope connected to Sky Safari, the good news is we can just bring this out and say go to there. Slewing to coordinates. And the, Slewing complete. And the great thing is that Sky Safari can move our scope as well. Now this only works um, when we have both things connected to the scope effectively. And I want to be honest with you, sometimes our connection to the scope gets fouled up in Sky Safari because this is actually um, a, this is actually a, a, an Android copy of Sky Safari operating inside of a, an emulator that makes the Windows computer think that it's actually an Android tablet. So it loses connection sometimes. This is, this is, let me, let me see if I can get these straight again. This is NGC 6974, and that's 6960. So this is 6974. So now let's go back to SharpCap. And I hope we saved that. Did we? Somebody tell me, did we save that? I hope we did. Let's stop live stacking and let's change the name to NGC 6974. And we don't have to um, uh, plate solve. Ah, oh, you're right. You are right as rain, Frank. Frank is saying, let's try to get all these objects in our field of view at once. So let's pick out a random star right about here. And let's go to that star. Slewing to coordinate. Slewing complete. Frank, you are a genius. Let's actually go one more star over, something like that. Slewing to coordinate. Slewing complete. You're a genius, Frank. You know, you are... So good at this. Thank you so much for suggesting that, Frank. Now, let's rename it. No, let's keep the name the same because we're still centered on NGC 69674, but let's add the other objects. So we're going to add, we're going to add, we're going to put 6974 first. Now let's go back to sharp cap. We're going to put 6974 first, and then we're going to put NGC um, 6960, and then we're going to put NGC uh, 6995, and start live stacking those and clear this. What a great idea. Frank's right. This 2600 is an APS-C size framed camera. So it's pretty wide camera. It's the largest frame that that doesn't vignette seriously bad on a Rasa 8. So yeah, look at that already coming in. See, there's what we were just looking at. There, there's that veil deal. Let's just quickly reset that. I wonder if we should have set this on 30 seconds. You know what, let's do, let's go ahead and put this on, maybe not. Let's do, let's put this on 30 seconds and look how instantly it changes the, let's do another um, color balance. And we wanna hover that right over those blocks right there. Let's bring these in a little bit. Still gathering light for the others. 
So that's that original one. It's being cut off a little bit. Uh, that's the one called um, NGC 6960. Now up here, we're starting to see NGC 6974. So Frank, if you know, if you know the names of these, help us sort these out. So 6960 is the Western Veil. So 6960 is the Western Veil, and that's this over here on this side. So our Rasa is kind of backwards, what we're looking at here. On the right is the Western Veil. And then this object here in the middle is 6974, and it is the Central Veil. Central veil. So that's going to be up here somehow. Let me get my bearings about me. It should be, yeah, it should be up, up here, this material that we're seeing here. And then over here on the left somewhere, should be 6995, and wow, 6995 is the Eastern Veil. So you can see that here, 6995 is this, apparently, this Eastern Veil. So that's the Western Veil, and this is the Eastern Veil. Well, that's the same view that we essentially have in the Rasa then. We're, we're okay. It's pitched a little bit just skewed a little bit, but on the right-hand side is the Western Veil. Here is the Eastern Veil, and then up here, all this stuff, and look how this kind of winds its way down through the whole thing, but especially it's up here at the top, and that's the Central Veil. Okay, let's go back and see if we can make out any of this. We're at 30 seconds. Let's bring this up here, and then let's boost these a little more. Hmm. I think this is going to require a little more time. We're at three minutes. You know, that's like not very long, three minutes, <laughs> to be able to capture this. I think these um, astro photos that we see, I've been listening to some of these guys. The last few nights I've been listening to some of these astro photographers, and I just have to admire their patience. I was listening to a guy today. He was talking about it was going to take him it was going to take him at least 3 full nights to gather the data that he needed to be able to make the picture that he wanted on one object. Can you imagine that you stay up? Now maybe he gets the camera going and he goes inside and watches the late show or something. But he's basically caring and shepherding and watching over that scope for three nights in a row, about five hours per night to get 15 hours to photograph one thing. And here we are out here, and we're already impatient after four or five minutes with electronically assisted astronomy. It's just a different bird altogether to do EAA. We are using the same exact tools that he uses but we are not like setting our settings in such a way that we're getting two minute subs, you know, with tracking going on and stuff. And then we do like six hours of those. That's how you get these astral photos like these, you know, this stuff that you're seeing uh, here, that stuff, that's how you get those pictures is you, you capture that data for like, five hours. Jeff says, I've started doing some astrophotography, Doug. It is a set up and go to bed situation for me. <laughs> so you've got a place where you can just leave your scope in the backyard and let it run and then go to bed. I think that's amazing. But you know what else that Jeff has to do? After he gathers all that data, he has to process it. And man, I just love to get it and go. You know, 
I, I've been sharing with you guys, I want to get the point that we can gather this stuff if we can in like nine minutes flat, you know. Let's do another color balance just to make sure that we're on track here, and we are. Oh, yeah, look at this western veil now. Look at how that's starting to just leap out of the picture. It's just standing out so much now from the dark contrast because of the live stacking. Let's darken the background a little bit now and get rid of some of that sky glow. And maybe if we do that, these objects will show up a little more. No, we don't have quite enough data yet. We're at six minutes. I tell you, we're going to wait till eight and a half minutes, and then we're going to leap. So we better hope that at eight and a half minutes, we can see something. Up here, you're starting to see something form. But wow, I am not seeing much out here yet. I don't know about you guys. And I don't like this green. Let's Let's drop this green a little more. And maybe that'll let us, you know what else we could do? We could try to raise the red just a little. Boost the red a little bit. No, that's too much, isn't it? Then the whole picture starts to look like we slung some. I put it together at 930, check it before bed, but it will park itself and shut off when done. I just wake up and download the data. That's cool, Jeff. Well, you're starting to do some of that that, that I really admire, that patience. Man, I just want to get 10 targets in one night rather than one target in 10 nights. Uh, but I do admire the photos after after they are gathered. Tell you what we're going to do now. We're going to get rid of these panels and try to take some of this in. I tell you what, we're starting to see it here, aren't we? But I don't know if we're seeing very much here yet. I wonder if our field of view is a little bit out of sync with what Sky Safari is showing us. And that could be, I mean, or it could be that we just need more time here. My goal is to have, Jeff says, one rig doing EAA while I'm out in the yard and one rig that I can leave up all night for the astrophotography data. Best of all worlds, master of none. <laughs> and then he's laughing. Well, let's see how much time we've gathered here because remember our rule. We're going to try our best to stay within our nine minutes. There it is. Eight minutes and 44 seconds. Well, we've captured this Western Veil well. We're starting to see shades of the central veil. But man, I am not making out much of the eastern veil here. Maybe we're off frame a little bit. Tell you what let's do. Let's save this. Doug needs the MBZ filter. You could be right. Um, I, I kind of like not having to change filters. But today, I received completely as a beta test from the people at Octopi Astro, the camera holder for the Rasa 11, and this time the engineers at Octopi Astro have engineered a removable filter holder. So it will finally not be a hassle anymore to switch filters in the Rasa 11. Um, does the Octopi adapter allow you to rotate the camera? This one does. The last one, it was really not very doable. You could do it, but the one for the Rasa 11, it does. Now, you know that that would require us exactly. We would have to walk outside uh, 200 feet away, and my Bluetooth headset starts to drop about 100 feet away from the building. Uh, but it does kind of catch back when I come back to the 100 feet mark. But at 200 feet, it is dropped out. But we could go out now with that slidable magnetic thing that the Octopi Astro folks have built in to the uh, Rasa 11 holder. And boy, is it huge and beefy and strong with all the adjustments there. We could do some filter switching, but I don't think we're going to want to because here's the secret. We did spring for the Celestron Rasa 11 filter for light pollution. And I am so sorry. Please forgive me, Lord. It is 600 and some dollars for that 
Celestron light pollution filter for the Ross 11, but it's supposed to be perfectly tuned for the Ross 11. Yeah, and flats as well. Tilt and filters in one, right, Jeff? Um, okay, I'm going to make sure that we do not have this red too high because this is looking a little high still for my eyes, but I, then again, I'm colorblind. I'm going to boost these up a little and see what we can see just before we go. No, we're starting to get that sky glow in the middle. Tell you what else let's do. Boy, that is, even though we're getting some of that glow, look, when we do it, we start seeing this. But that middle glow just ruins it, doesn't it? And if we bring this down, then the green takes over. Nah. Oh my goodness, what is that? It's because I went way too high on red. But look, now we see the Eastern Veil. <laughs> but that looks like some kind of candy cane Christmas. Bring that back down, Doug. That's nuts. Oh my goodness, I think we are seeing it here, gang. What is that? Look at that. We got it. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. We're seeing the complete veil now. It's because this is so high, I think. Even though it's a weird sky in the middle, we are starting to see a full veil now. Boy, with that red boosted, I wonder what happens if we pull this gain up to 300. Am I going to ruin our image here? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? The, the central veil. Let's do another color balance just to straighten things out and pull our blacks down to be pretty black. And then let's Boost these up. No, it really helps to pull that green down. That's that Louisville light pollution. And then to boost that red up a little. Not that much. <laughs> Let's pull our blacks back over. And pull our red down just a little more. And now try to boost this up a little bit better. Kind of have to get that red up. I'm going to hold the shift key down and move that red up a little bit just till we can see. So that's 13 minutes. Flats would remove that, you think. You might be right because I'm not using flats. Let's look here under uh, pre-processing. Pre oh, the uh, International Space Station's crossing the sky. We don't have darks or flats applied in this. Lance. Look at the filters that Lance is trying. He's asking, yeah, if you're going to buy all those, you got to be rich. That's what my suggestion is. Go strike oil somewhere. I spent 600 some dollars on one filter, and it's the Ross 11 light pollution filter that Celestron makes. You know, we got to jump off this target, guys. This is taking us too long. <laughs> but we are starting to get it. Let's bring these greens down a little more. Oh, my, that made the blues too obvious. <laughs> okay. I think this is How much are those filters? Tell the truth, guys. Tell the truth how much those cost. Somebody confess. Okay, we are going to save that before I do anything else. 
Look at that long file name. 32 frames, 15 minutes of data, but once and for all, we have the entire Western, Central, and Eastern Vale captured there with a lot of other junk. I tell you, this is like compromise after compromise here. We would have to stay on this like an astrophotographer. Okay, let's let's be satisfied. This is EAA. Uh, okay, we're gonna stop live stacking. Three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars. Oh, Jeff, thanks for the encouragement. Um, you are so kind. All right, let's go to the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, wait, we got to do our observation real quick. Um, see, it throws up this little... We uh, fortunately um, benefited from a friend named Frank who encouraged us to frame the entire veil in the view and it worked wow western central and eastern veil in one frame amazing call it a win doug <laughs> you're nice let's travel to the gulf of mexico caldwell 20 you know, I am looking forward to reading Slowing about these to now. Coordinates. To reading about these. Slewing complete. Are we still going to be bent over backwards across the meridian? My goodness. We've spent the entire night with a crook, a crook in our neck. Um, did I not? Uh, let's see. Let's rename here. This is uh, NGC 7000, otherwise known as Caldwell 20 or the Gulf of Mexico. I'm starting to like these long file names. Um, let's keep this on 300 for a second. I'll tell you what. Let's make this five seconds for just a moment. Oh no, we're good. And let's try it on Gulf of Mexico. You want to try it on 20 seconds? At, let's keep it on 300. And let's see if we get a good frame with one subframe first before we live stack. We have eight viewers now. We I noticed a while ago we reached a peak of like was it 15 viewers? If you're on there and you haven't told us where you're from yet, please uh, please tell us, say hi. Uh, we're broadcasting from Louisville, the outskirts. Please um, tell us where you're uh, located. How about that? We got about uh, eight folks here tuned in. Okay, I think we're ready to live stack. That's, I don't see any nebula in that though. I wonder if we should just do a quick plate solve to make sure we're looking at the right place because I do not see a nebula in that. Two inch L extreme on the classifieds right now. So you buy some of these used, huh, Jeff?
you know, I could not imagine spending $600 for one filter. I just couldn't. I couldn't imagine it. But I have loved just putting this filter in this Rasa 8 and then just leaving it. And, you know, I think it does me well here in this Wordle 6 sky glow. Sinking to coordinates. Just 200 slewing, degrees. Slewing complete. That was not worth it. it. We were already close enough, Doug. Why did you do that? Um, okay. Are we ready? Is it? Let's wait till this subframe finishes. Now, we're, yeah, see, look, that would have been in our live stacking. If you can imagine all that stuttering around, since it did move our our scope a little bit, it moved it enough to, look, that's 0 0.02 degrees right there. Now we know what two hundredths of a degree does. <laughs> it makes that stuttering. Okay, now we're ready to live stack. So this is the, go my goodness, oh, we got to clear. Um, the Gulf of Mexico, C20, or NGC 7000. Let's go back over to Sky Safari and go here to the Gulf of Mexico. NGC 7000. NGC 7000 is the famous North American Nebula in Cygnus. This huge cloud in the shape of the familiar earthly continent lies just east of the first magnitude star Deneb. The object can be seen as a distinct brightening of the Milky Way with the unaided eye. The tapered form of the nebula can be spotted in binoculars, or even finder scopes, with 40 millimeter objectives. High power spoils the effect, for the nebula is not small. The Gulf of Mexico region shows dark bays and knots, a relatively starless shores. Here it is believed new stars are forming. The outlines of both coasts of North America can be followed in small telescopes, but with low power. At star parties, it is often asked how large is the nebula in comparison to the real North American continent. If the nebula were reduced to the size of North America, then the Earth, reduced by the same amount, would now be small enough to be completely wrapped up inside a postage stamp. And that's our whole planet. We would be postage stamp size. So let's get a sense of where we are in the sky so we can center on this. And now let's back off of it. This is the North American Nebula, as he called it. So there's the Meridian, and there's Polaris. We've spent much of tonight on the Meridian. Did you notice that? Uh, now let's look up toward... Oh my goodness, we are pointed almost to the zenith. There's the zenith, and there's our scope. So let's center on that and then zoom in. Wow, that is a huge target. You know, if we would have been on the ball, we would have looked at this first and we would have bumped our we would have bumped our scope over cuz trying to see what which is which? Is this is this Lake Michigan? <laughs> I guess that's Lake Michigan, and then is this supposed to be Florida? Or is that upside down? So maybe is that... Is it reversed? Is, is that Florida, and it's inverted? Anybody know? And then what is this? This is IC5070, the Pelican Nebula. So that's a completely different thing. But look, we would be able to get both of these in the same view if we just changed our... Let's go back to SharpCap and let's take a look at this and see if we can make any sense out of this. That's the Gulf. It's upside down. Now let's see how the Rasa... Oh my goodness, look at all that sky glow. So let's first of all reset that. And now let's reset this and that. And now let's reset that and this. And now let's bring these over and this over. 
Wow, that's actually pretty impressive, guys. Look at that. You're pointing to the Gulf, not the lake. The other peninsula to the left is Florida. Pelican is next door. So is this Florida? And that's the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, I bet that's it, right? So we kind of have to look at it. Nah, I'm still not seeing it, guys. Florida looks a little bit crooked to me. I guess it's not a perfect... Maybe, maybe if you just looked at this much and didn't count that, is that the Gulf of Mexico? It, it is called the Gulf of Mexico, right? And so it would be fitting that this would be the Gulf of Mexico, right? Who names these things? Ooh, Cygnus Wall, looking good. Is that the Cygnus Wall? What is the Cygnus Wall? The larger is Mexico. That's the Gulf of Mexico? Okay. Um, let's boost these a little bit more. Man, look how many stars are there. Wow. That's a tremendous number of stars. Let's, you know, we can't zoom in on this because this is taking up the entire frame. This is a great squint really hard, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great target for the Rasa, isn't it? You know, I'm kind of sad because if the Rasa 11 zooms in by a factor of 50 more percent, we're not going to be able to frame this in the Rasa 11. Let's cancel the whole deal. Send the Rasa 11 back right now. No way are we hanging on to that. Just kidding. Boy, look how bright that's getting. It's because of this gain 300, isn't it? Wow. I just can't believe that's up there. I can't believe that if we walked out and looked up in the sky, I can't believe that we could see. It would just look like the Milky Way, wouldn't it? It just looked like a piece of the Milky Way. But in, in this telescope now, it is the coolest looking hydrogen alpha cloud. And there are so many stars. Let's let's zoom in on those clouds, those stars, just for a second. How many stars are there there? I just want to say that these stars are so much better shaped than they used to be. Back when I first started with this Octopi Astro camera holder. Oh my goodness, my stars in the corners looked horrible. Let me go all the way over in this corner and look. They are just, just, just slightly elongated. And that's after seven minutes with no guiding. They're just slightly elongated. But look, there are no seashells now. Just a little bit elongated in the upper right corner. These are looking great in the upper left corner. We're supposed to be looking at the Gulf of Mexico nebula, Doug, but I just had to enjoy these for a second. This is a commercial, officially, for Octopi Astro's new 8 Rasa 8 camera holder. If you purchase that Rasa 8 camera holder, once it becomes available, this is what it can do for you. It can straighten out all your... <laughs> Thanks so much for the encouragement, <laughs> Jeff. This is that, this is that so much, we, these would have looked like seashells before, or manta rays, or I don't know what, it, they would have looked horrible. And now with this Octopi Astro unit, which is not on the market yet, it, he's still fine tuning it. But um, once it becomes available, highly recommended. Okay, there's eight minutes on the Gulf of Mexico, Caldwell 20, NGC 7000, and I'm saying, woohoo! That is a beautiful nebula, and the Rasa 8 captures it. Wow. So we're going to save this exactly as seen. 
And we're going to wait till it tells us, look at all those file names, all those object names in the file name. I've had problems with egg stars recently caused by camera cooler. Huh. I've never heard of such a thing. So you have to replace the fan? And that's on your what? The Which scope is that? And which camera? Because that sounds horrible. <laughs> Gulf of Mexico, uh, new observation. And I don't know how to put this into words because the truth is, this looked in sharp cap like one of the most astounding captures to date. This must be incredibly bright and broad across the frame. I can only frame about 20% in my 10 inch. Oh, Jeff says it's a 294 monochrome. So that's the ZWO ASI 294 monochrome pro. I thought the 294 was an amazing, amazing camera. Oh, $7 fan. Well, hats off to you that you know how to do that because that's like taking a camera apart. That's pretty cool. Um, didn't we do the Cirrus Nebula already? Oh, I see. There's a Cirrus 1 and a Cirrus 2. 69.92. Let's assume we already did that. And let's go to this Spiral Galaxy uh, C12. We're not live stacking anymore. So let's slew to that. Slewing to coordinates. Doug, I think you would really like the NGC 7000 area with a dual band filter. Slewing complete. You guys are trying to get me to spend all this filter money. Just don't show this live stream to my wife. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. She's really very uh, codependent, like to an alcoholic. <laughs> she's very, she's very kind. I can't complain at all. Uh, but I got to tell you, I am looking forward to this observatory. It's uh, Explora Dome, eight foot, and the concrete guy comes in 17 days to put in the pedestal pier and the isolated concrete slab for this uh, dome to rest on. Uh, the people at Peer Tech Inc., I just talked to them. I said, could you please, please, please try to get the Peer here? But even if they don't, I just broke down and yesterday ordered a Ioptron, whatever you call their tripod. They don't call it a tripod. It's a tri -peer or something like that. Uh, this is Caldwell 12 or NGC 6946. So even if the slab and the pier, the pier pedestal are not done, then at least um, once the slab, I'm sorry, even if the metal pier from PierTech has not arrived, once the slab is in, we can put that nice tripod, tri or whatever that's called, NGC 6946, Caldwell 12. We can finally put that on that tri -peer pod, whatever it's called, and uh, put the Rasa 11 and this new Ioptron 70. It's the C E M, I think. C E M 70. And it's the, um, let's start live stacking here. It's the, it's the one that has the electronics in the mount so that can you see in our scope cam, see all those cables? that are between the scope and the mount. In the new Ioptron mount, uh, those all pass through the mount. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, you're funny. Hide the cost of the filters and the cost of the observatory. 
anyway, uh, the, there won't there won't be cables now. I won't have to worry about cable management because the cables are in the mount with the the Ioptron CEM seventy. Um, this is NGC sixty nine forty six. So let's go over here and search for this NGC sixty nine forty six. Oh my goodness, this is the fireworks galaxy. It is kind of near to us, relatively speaking, but this is the one where we see all the supernovae in it, isn't it? I, I think there have been like 10 times the number of supernovae in this galaxy than any other galaxy in existence that we know of. It says it's faint, but obvious. And I'm sorry, nine supernovae, not 10. But that's as of March 2009. I think others have been seen since 2009. This thing is like going crazy. And you might ask, why? Well, because it's undergoing a tremendous burst. Let me tell you why. Because it's undergoing a tremendous burst of star formation with no obvious cause. This is like a doctor. And you say, why am I having this heart problem? It's an idiopathic heart. And you say, what's idiopathic? Nobody knows. It's like, we just say, well, it's undergoing star formation. Of course, that's what supernovae are. They're blowing up. Uh, the spirals light up with interacting with another galaxy, but it is rather isolated in space. The suggested explanation for the high star formation rate is the recent accretion of many primordial low mass neutral hydrogen clouds. Now, if that's not a mouthful, we don't know what is. Let's go back to sharp cap and let's try to make some kind of sense out of this picture. Boy, when you're first doing all those resets, the picture goes crazy, doesn't it? Can anybody tell? Oh, there it is. I see it. And look, there's something way over here. What is that? NGC 6939. It's a star-rich open cluster. <whistles> Let's go in about like this so we can try to look at both of those. Oh, yeah. That's a little too much. That's 33%. Let's drop down to 25%. <gasps> Did you hear? It's breathtaking. You know how you know it's breathtaking? If you go... <gasps> Um, look at that super neat looking spiral shape coming into being there in three minutes. I love EAA. I love EAA. I love EAA. <laughs> Electronically assisted astronomy is where it's at. And I just ended that sentence with a preposition. But it is, gang. This is so cool to be able to see this. Look at that beautiful cluster. Why, why don't we just zoom in on that cluster for a minute? Let's come into about 50% and go up here. <gasps> look at that. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Soon the clusters will start. I wish I could hang this on my house. That's amazing. <laughs> it is. It is great fireworks, Jeff. Uh, oh, while we're at 75%, let's go over and look at this galaxy. <gasps> look at this. You know, I think... Limit uh, warning. Oh, see, did you hear that? We are at the limit, and now our, I'm going to hurry up and save this because I think that means we're bent over backwards too much. What that means is that our rasa is like this, and it can't go back any farther, and it's saying, stop, all right, already. Okay, so let's stop live stacking this. And can we please get to something that is... Uh, let's do our new observation here. 
this is like my new favorite best object. And that last object was my favorite for five minutes. Uh, this open cluster, which was NGC, NGC, um, 6939 was so much like Christmas. But this fireworks galaxy is amazing. Oh, gang. This has been one of my favorite nights so far. It's got to be. I got my good friends here. Yeah, that means impending crash, except I think this uh, Green Swamp software makes it stop. Um, let's go look at that real quick and see. Where is my, there it is. See, it's still tracking, okay. It just gave us a warning, but it is getting close. Uh, I wonder what would happen if we flip side of here. Can we try this? I've never done this. Let's try it. Can we? Are we adventurous? Look at that. Look at that. Is that not the most fun ever? So you click that flip side appear button and it automatically figures out that you are about to break your back and it flips the telescope clear around and puts you to the same object again. This has been my favorite night so far. It has to be. Not only because of all these fun friends that are with me, but also because of these great images that we've seen and also because um, it, it just has been so Swing fun. Complete. Now, just out of curiosity, let's plate solve. Let's go back out to, let's cancel this and plate solve. Um, plates off. And let's see how far off it was after a pure flip, a meridian flip. I'll tell you the green swamp software is the berries. It shows you that cool little three-dimensional view of your scope. And it's just well designed. Hats off to the GSS people. Sinking to coordinates. Slewing to coordinate. Slewing complete. A quarter of a degree off after a meridian flip. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the way everything is working. You know, I remember nine months ago when you guys had to tell me, Doug, open up sharp cap. I mean, wow. I was so green. I mean, all we have to do is go back and look at some of those initial live streams if I didn't already delete them. This is so much fun. All right. We got time for one more object. No, we have five minutes left. Uh, let's do the cocoon nebula and call it a day. Slew to object. Slewing to coordinates. And. Slewing complete. Good. I'm glad we didn't have to flip here again. Flip Meridian. <laughs> um, I recently switched from EQ mod to Green Swamp to control my EQ6R. Yes, Frank. Good job. Uh, let's go to Sharp Cap and put in a new liking it very much. Good. Let's put in uh, C19 was the primary name that Astro Planner used. And it also is IC5146. And it's also called Cocoon Nebula. Nebula. And 
we are already there, right? And we played solved. So let's start live stacking and clear out the last picture. So this is the Cocoon Nebula. It is um, C19. C19, this is our last object. Rats, this is so sad. This has been so much fun. You guys have made this fun. Thank you so much. Uh, the Cocoon Nebula is cataloged as IC5146. It is a strikingly beautiful emission nebula and star cluster located about 4,000 light years away in the constellation Cygnus. It's located near Pi Cygni, the open cluster NGC 7209 in La and the bright open cluster M39. So let's hope that at least we can see the Cocoon Nebula. It's about 15 light years wide. It holds a bright red emission nebula and a blue reflection nebula and dark absorption nebula, nebulae. This thing has three kinds, all three kinds of nebulae. Bright red, which is like hydrogen, blue, which is reflection, and maybe, I guess that's more, what, oxygen? Or just ionized oxygen? And then dark absorption nebulae, which is black, like soot. So let's see if we can find this back in sharp cap real quick. Uh, Dennis, good to have you aboard. Our skies are great here tonight. That's so kind of you, Dennis. Thanks for the encouragement. Uh-oh, Jeff, sorry about your skies. Oh my goodness, can barely see across the street. I'm so sorry. Father, please forgive me for being so happy. May we commiserate with these guys. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's reset that and reset this and that and this and balance that and pull this and that right about there. No? Yeah, that's not bad. Let's pull that over a little bit. Get that off of that. Now let's bring this in until our reds, which are too high here. Hmm. Let's uh, zoom in on the sum so we can see the object better. Too much. Too much. Like about right there. Look, we can see the black already. That's why I love these sessions, Doug. I live vicariously through your EA setup. You're so, you're so funny. Oh my goodness, look, there it is. Hello, IC 5146 Cocoon Nebula. Now we're already seeing the hydrogen, the red, and we're seeing the uh, absorption nebulae, the black. But does anybody see the blue yet? Maybe we need to like cheat Let's cheat and turn up the blue so we can say we saw it. Because we're our time is up. We're just going to bump up this blue a little bit. Oh my goodness, the whole sky is blue. That's too much. That's why, oh, Jeff says nice. It is beautiful, but, but boy, I don't see any. Well, maybe if we reduce the red a little. You know, we might now be able to see some blue. Let's bump this up a little bit until that sky starts to glow. Anybody see blue there? Maybe on the edges, it's just starting to be a little bit blue. Am I imagining that? Yes, I'm imagining it. Dennis, you're so kind. Thanks for encouraging a guy on. You know, I think we're going to say that we saw it. Even though I'm not sure we can. It is not as red out here in these edges, but I don't know if it's blue yet. It's more like a gray. Okay, so Dennis sees it. That makes it official. 
Thank you, Dennis. We are going to save this right now, exactly seen. And Frank, I'll need to check Green Swamp. No luck getting all these programs to work together yet. Oh, my goodness. I have nightmares about these programs not working. Now we're going to go back to Astro Planner. We're going to say, was this Cocoon Nebula? We're going to say New Observation. And we're going to say, we saw three kinds of nebulae. Red, H2, or HA, uh, grayish blue, but Dennis saw faint blue. Um, and this is emission. Are there two M's in emission? Nebula, nebulae, and dark nebulae, which really are just soot. The stardust and the leftover burn-up stuff and just dust, but not dust mites. There are no dust mites living in outer space, just in case you wondered. This wraps up our program tonight. We didn't make it through as many targets, but we had fun just the same. We saw NGC 6888, otherwise known as Caldwell 27, the Crescent Nebula. Uh, Caldwell, 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 Caldwell. We saw NGC 6826, Caldwell 15, the Blinking Planetary. We saw NGC 6885, Caldwell 37, and Caldwell 20 in the Volpeculi Cluster. We saw NGC 6960, C34, the Cirrus Nebula, which was the beginning of that beautiful veil stuff. We saw NGC 7000, Caldwell 20, Gulf of Mexico. We saw NGC 6992, Caldwell 33, and also NGC 6995 and the Cirrus Nebula, which was like, I think, the other side of the veil. And then NGC 6946, otherwise known as C12, the Fireworks Galaxy. You know what? We ought to put that here. How do we do that? Yeah, like this. Fireworks Galaxy. We also saw NGC. No, I think we. This. Caldwell 19, the Cocoon Nebula, Nebula which is otherwise cataloged as IC5146. What a fun night. And you guys made it fun because you helped out and you gave us somebody to talk to another tick in the wind column. Bless you, Jeff. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Uh, if you like this kind of content, you'll help us a great deal. If you click that thumbs up and if you subscribe, how does it help us? Nobody knows, but everybody says this anyway, so we all say it. Have a good evening. May God bless you. Don't forget to keep looking up at the Emerald Hill skies and whatever the skies are where you are. And have a happy, merry September 10th, wherever you are tonight. Wow. Thanks a lot for being here. You guys that did this with us live.